In this video I'll be working with mains voltage, which is dangerous and can kill you. Mishandling of such a high voltage can lead to injuries or even death. If you're not confident in your electrical knowledge or experience, please do not recreate things I'll show in this video. Since my first video on this channel, I've been mentioning a lab bench power supply. It's one of the most basic projects every electronics hobbyist can make, and it's one of the most important tools on my desk. Such supplies usually look something like this. An old ATX power supply from a computer, with some binding posts added to it. It's a simple way to build it, but it lacks important safety features like fuses, and it's just too basic. I decided to build one again, but this time it will last, and I'll add a lot of useful features to it. I'll show you how everything works, and hopefully you'll learn something by the end of the video. This is the finished supply. Everything is enclosed in a 3D printed enclosure, and while looking at it, you'd hardly guess that it's a basic electronics hobby project. An ATX supply has three main voltage rails that we are interested in, 3.3 volts, 5 volts and 12 volts. Each channel or rail has its own power switch, a fuse and two sets of binding posts which are connected in parallel. Next to them is a power delivery slash quick charge 3.0 module, a ground connection and the main power switch. On the sides of the supply I've added some 40mm fans for cooling, and on the back is the AC inlet power socket which has its own power switch and a fuse for added protection. I'll show it to you in action later, but now it's time to mention the components. The main thing that you'll need to build a basic lab bench power supply is an ATX supply from a computer. It doesn't have to be powerful or anything special. Anything will work in this case. It just needs to work. If you don't have one laying around and you don't want to spend money on a brand new one, used supplies like this can be found very cheap. I've even found some for 5 to 10 euros and they could be used without a problem. The next important thing that you'll need is a load resistor to make the voltage stable while having a low load connected. This is important if you're using an old supply and the resistor will cost you no more than 2 euros. To choose the resistor, you have to take a look at the supply's specification and see which voltage rail offers most current. If it's the 5V rail, get a 10 ohm, 10 watt resistor, and for the 12V rail, a 24 ohm one will work. Just take one wire from the voltage rail you're working with, connect it to the one side of the resistor, and the other side of the resistor connects to ground or one black wire. In my case, the power supply was made recently and has this feature already built in, so I'm going to skip this step and if I notice anything strange in the future, I can easily add it later. Those are the core parts that every supply needs, but since I wanted to add more features, these are the rest of the components that are not as important but are needed to build this project. 3 voltmeter ammeter displays. The part number of these is M430. The maximum measuring voltage is up to 100 volts and 10 amps for the current. Note that the 100 volt rating is only for measuring, the power supply maximum is up to 30 volts. Next are the binding posts. I got these ones because they have a little hole inside, which is useful when you want to connect a bare piece of wire to them. They are a standard 4mm banana jack sockets and you can find the links down below. If you are going to build this supply, you'll need 13 of them. 6 black ones, 6 red ones and 1 yellow for the ground. Each channel will have its own fuse, so I got these panel mount fuse sockets. They support 5 by 20 mm fuses and you simply unscrew them and fit the fuse inside. And for the fuses I'm going to use 10 amp ones. For switching each channel on and off, I got 3 12 mm push button switches. They have an LED inside and I'll make it light up when the particular channel is turned on. For switching everything on and off, I got a single 16 mm push button switch, which is the same one as the other but in a larger size. I wanted to have some USB connectors on the supply, so I got this USB charging module. It has power delivery and quick charge 3.0. It's powered with a 12 to 24 volt supply and it even has its own fuse. To keep the parts inside cool, I got three 12 volt 40 mm fans. They are going to be mounted to the side of the case and I'll show you where to connect them later. Initially, I wanted to use the fan that came with the supply, but it was too large, which would make the whole enclosure bigger while wasting time and materials. ATX supplies have a 5 volt standby by wire that's live when the AC is connected. I'll connect a 5mm LED to it and it's going to be held with this little plastic LED panel mount holder. A current limiting resistor will be connected in series with the LED. That way I'll know when the power switch on the back is turned on. And speaking of the power switch on the back, I'm going to use this power connector which has the switch that lights up and a fuse holder for added safety. 3P channel and 3N channel MOSFETs are also going to be needed later. It doesn't matter which ones you get but make sure that they can handle the current. And and that's everything I'm going to use besides some screws, inserts and nuts. The next thing is to look at the enclosure. This is the assembly and as you can see the enclosure is made from a few parts, 9 to be exact. The front and back panels hold everything together and I've created some sleeves to hide the seam between two shells. I decided to add feet to the sleeves so I'll be printing them with a flexible TPU filament. 
The front panel has holes for the display, binding posts, fuses, switches, the USB-C charger and the standby LED, while the back one has a hole for the inlet connector and a mesh for airflow. The cooling fans are mounted to the sides and I've created some covers to keep my fingers outside. Inside the enclosure you can see that I've added some bosses for M3 inserts. They are going to be used to screw the power supply's PCB. This part is made specifically for my supply, but I'll upload step models so you can modify it yourself. Before starting anything, I wanted to show you how everything is going to work. That way, the build process will be much faster. To turn on the ATX power supply, connect the mains voltage to it and short the green wire with one black wire on the 20 or 24 pin connector. You will likely see the fan start to spin. The next step is to test if all of the voltage rails are present. To do this, keep the green wire connected to ground and using a multimeter measure one brown wire that has to be at 3.3 volts, then one red wire that has to be at 5 volts and one yellow wire that has to be at 12 volts. If all voltages are present, your supply is fine and you can continue with the project. The next thing I want to show you is how I'm going to use the MOSFETs. 3P channel MOSFETs are going to be used to switch each voltage rail on and off. The 12mm switches are tiny and 10 amps of current would definitely damage them. Each voltage rail from the power supply gets its own MOSFET and will be connected to the source pin. The drain of the MOSFET will conduct the electricity out to the binding posts. The gate on each MOSFET is used for switching it on and off. In this case, while using a p-channel MOSFET, you will need a pull-up resistor, so that the MOSFET resets when you release the switch. The output of the MOSFET is going to the binding posts, but will also be connected to the yellow wire of the voltmeter. By connecting it there, the voltmeter will measure the exact voltage that's on the binding post. The negative binding post connects to the red tick wire of the M-meter, and the black tick wire from the M-meter connects to ground. It's basically the same thing with all three rails, and that's it for switching, but now let's talk about the lights on the switches. If I was to connect the LEDs directly to the voltage rails, they would light up when I turn the specific channel on. But since the voltage rails aren't the same, the lights wouldn't shine with the same brightness. To solve this issue, I connected them all to 12 volts, and I'll be controlling them with N-channel MOSFETs. You can see how the 3.3V rail uses 3.3V on the gate to control it, 5V rail uses 5V, and the 12V rail uses 12V. N-channel MOSFETs are a little bit different. You connect them to the low side of the circuit. Source always has to have a direct connection connection to ground, and in this case a pull down resistor is needed, 15k1. The 1k resistor on the left is used to limit the current to the high side if anything goes wrong, and the drain you connect to the high side of the circuit, so in this case the cathode of the LED. And it's basically the same thing with all three LEDs. The only thing different is that each MOSFET uses a different voltage rail to control the gate pin. I quickly connected one of the switching circuits to make sure it works, and as you can see it does. First, I'm going to take apart the ATX supply. Inside you'll find some capacitors which can be charged to a very high voltage, so be very careful and do not touch anything with your bare hands. I'm going to use a screwdriver to short the pins of each cap, so I'm 100% sure that they are discharged. Then I took the 3D printed parts and installed the inserts into their holes. After that, I started with the front panel. I didn't have much time to figure out the exact dimensions needed for these displays, so I created a bit larger hole and I'm going to secure them with hot glue. Next are the fuse holders. They have their own nut for securing them to the front panel and I'm going to put 10 amp fuses inside right away. Then the push button switches and the binding posts got secured. I secured everything with some more hot glue. Then I connected the LED resistors. One resistor goes to the standby LED and the other three to the LEDs inside the switches. I took the wire with the fuse holder that came with the USB charger and connected it to the positive terminal of the module. The connection was protected with heat shrink. Then I got the thick wire of the displays, plugged in the connectors and shortened each red wire. I stripped them and connected each one to one side of its fuse. Then I took some thick electrical wire and connected the ground binding posts in parallel. After that I took some 12 gauge wire and connected them to the other side of the fuses. Then I connected each set of the positive winding posts in parallel as well. I plugged in the 3 pin connector of the meters and soldered the yellow wire to the positive terminals. After that I started connecting all grounds I could find together, which left me with less wires after each connection. And then it was time for the MOSFETs. I started with the p-channel ones, to switch each rail on and off. I won't explain everything in detail here, because I already shown the schematic and I don't want this video to be an hour long. 
After that, the end channel MOSFETs got also connected, and they were all secured to the mirrors with some hot glue. This wouldn't be a good idea if the MOSFETs were to heat up, but in my case, they are an absolute overkill for this current, so they will stay cool. I connected all of the source grounds together, the gates to the positive voltage rails, and drains to the cathodes of the switch LEDs. At this point, I was ready to continue building the rest of the supply. I did most of the work here, and it will be a bit easier from now on. I secured the power supply's PCB to the standoffs on the bottom shell of the case. While looking at the supply at this point, you can probably spot the main issue that has to be sorted out. All of these wires. While looking at the pinout of the 24-pin ATX connector, I started pulling out wires I needed. The first ones I took were the purple standby wire and the green one for turning the supply on. I took the grey wire too because I thought that I'm going to connect it to the LED on the main power switch. But later I realized that the grey wire is also a 5V one and my LED works on 12V so I'll take one yellow wire for the LED later. I cut off the rest of the connectors and started separating the wires that I'm going to need. I connected the purple and green wires first, so I can see if the power supply has power and so I can turn it on. I connected one yellow wire to the LED's anode of the main power switch. Then I connected the power for the USB charging module. I connected all the red power wires from the voltmeter displays and connected them to one 12V yellow wire. Then some grounds needed to be connected and after that we can take a look at the remaining wires. I cut off the wires I'm not going to use, and those were the blue one, a white one and the brown one. Yellow wires are 12 volts, red ones are 5 volts and orange ones are 3.3 volts. I'll take 5 wires from each voltage rail, shorten them a bit and connect them together. The remaining ones can be cut off and for the grounds I connected them all together since they are going to carry more current. I connected everything together with thin wires I had laying around so I can do a small test before closing everything together. The other PCB in the ATX supplies had some capacitors, so I didn't want to connect the main voltage directly to the board. The wires were a bit too short so I had to extend them a bit. And after I did, I connected the AC connectors to the PCB. Then I got some gloves just for safety, plugged it in and turned it on. And everything worked, first try. I took the plastic cover from the ATX supplies case and cut it to size to fit inside my enclosure, so that nothing from the front panel touches the PCB. Then I took some thicker wires and connected everything together. After connecting everything together, it was time to finally assemble the case. I took the cooling fans and screwed them to the case, and after that I connected them in parallel. Then I realized that I won't be able to access the remaining nuts, so I glued them to the fans with some more super glue. After that I needed to connect some wires to the AC inlet socket. I wanted to keep the main PCB because of those capacitors I mentioned earlier, so I desoldered the connector and the switch so I can remove them from the ATX case. I shorted the connections of the switch and connected the live and neutral that were going to the power supply's PCB. I connected the earth wire to the ground binding post as well. After connecting everything together, I wrapped it with a ton of electrical tape, and after weeks of modeling, printing, soldering and assembling the supply, I made it to the end of the build chapter. The fans got their screws, and so did the front and back panels. To show it to you in action, I turned it on, and saw that the displays were flickering on camera, because of the refresh rate, so I quickly adjusted it. As you can see, all channels can be turned off and on, with the small push button switches. I measured each voltage rail and it was correct. Then I connected some stuff I had laying around to see how the displays will measure the current. And that's it, the supply is done and everything works. I had a lot of fun building this project and I hope you learned something while watching me put it together. I'd like to make these videos more often and if you'd like to support me check out my Patreon. In the description you will find links to all parts I used. And that's it, thanks for watching, subscribe and see you next time.